All right, so um, today I will be talking about how much corn silage a calf can eat. And this is kind of an interesting question because I have some conversations with people and they say, well, he can eat an awful lot of it. Uh, and they just go from there. Before I go down that path too terribly far, I like to show people random things that I came across. Um, and I was out shopping with my wife the other day in a, a store in Fargo, and I couldn't help but take a picture of this particular um, tag that was on one of the clothing pieces there. So I'm not exactly sure how this works, but 100% vegan leather where no animals have been harmed in the making of this garment. So it was classic. On to corn silage. Uh, big topic. First, we're going to talk about the product. We're going to move into talk a little bit about the calves and specific goals that we have for those calves, and then use those answers to get to the whole root question of how much silage can we actually feed. The question we'll start with is, is all silage created equally? And uh, Carl Hoppe, you asked about yield differences from location to location. And I know we've got a location out in Napoleon that is listening in. And for some people there, they were probably very, um, how should I say, envious of the people who are getting these 20 ton an acre um, silage yields. I've been in contact with several producers who were getting about four ton silage yields. And we start to look at a product like this. Uh, and it's a very, very drought stressed um, crop. In some locations, we were between three to four feet tall, and uh, somewhere cobs, if it got any cobs, uh, about two to three inches in length. So we need to really define what we've got, and of course the best way to do that is to go out and actually test that feed, figure out where we're at with our nutrient contents. Uh, this is a publication that Greg Lardy and Vern Anderson put out. It was actually talking about earlage and snaplage and some different things that fall into the silage realm. So I'm just going to highlight the bottom here and, and look at the nutrient variation that there can be from you know this well-eared silage product back to a drought stressed product. Again with a TDN variance of at least uh, five percentage points uh, this could very easily be ten percentage points with some of this young immature crop that did never get ears. So again, we've really got to define what it is that we're looking at in terms of the actual crop that gets put in the bunker or the silo. I'm going to very briefly breeze over these, but uh, if you've ever looked at your bunks and seen all these little rosettes, little pieces of cob there that the cattle didn't touch, forage processing is an option that really reduces uh, how much waste the cattle leave behind. John did talk about some waste in the silage processing, uh, this is waste that occurs actually after that animal uh, has been exposed to that. Other places of waste we really want to tighten down on are what's our face management look like on our silage pile, um, what does that spoilage layer look like over the top. Just for your information, uh, if you've read anything about the dairy industry lately, they are all the rage about a product called shredlage. Shredlage is basically a type of forage processing that they have a longer length of cut, but it's cut in a whole bunch of pieces lengthwise. So what this does is that you can have longer product, you can have better digestibility, increase the dry matter intake. Right now this is tremendously expensive and it's not in our beef world yet uh, to any extent, but this may be something in the future. Uh, so if you hear about it, you can, you can say you've actually heard it before. All right. Impact of silo type, and there was actually a question out there. This is a facility I used to manage, and we had all kinds of different things going on. So this red circle, first one, is a, a big bunker silo that we would have uh, corn silage in every year. We had all these upright staves and harvestors, and this type of silo you had really dictated the product that could get out of there. Uh, and the question was, the, the first line here, did it rain when you were chopping? Okay. Uh, that can have a tremendous impact on the quality of the product, but I was never really that concerned about the quality of the product. I was concerned about knowing what I was feeding. Okay? Same thing as we start on the top of one of the staves or one of the harvest stores. As that product sits there, if there's any leaching going on, it's going from top to bottom. 
Okay, so we're going to have some wet spots in there. Uh, we can also have issues with infield variation or moving from one field to the next. What type of variation is there? Um, are also beginning to end. So there's a lot of different things within a silo that we can look at. And again, it mainly really determines um, differences in dry matter content. So if we want to know what we're actually feeding to our calves, uh, it does pay to, to go out and do some dry matter sampling. Uh, this is a simple calculation where we calculate dry matter. We have a wet sample weight, the column A. Okay, we dry that down. We can dry that down in a number of ways. It actually works pretty well to dry that down in a microwave. Okay, so we need a scale, paper plate, and a microwave. And I'm not sure if uh, your significant other would love you to do this in the house, but it has happened on occasion. I guess it's better than putting a cedar in the microwave. Uh, and then we just do a little bit of math. So what was our dry sample weight divided by our wet sample weight? That gives us a dry matter content of that product. Typical silage between 30, we're right around 35%. Some of the dry stuff, if we let it get away from us, can be up to 45%. At that point, we have pretty uh, poor fermentation characteristics. So we do all of these diet calculations, and they are in dry matter because that's the easiest way to put all feeds on the same level. Uh, the other calculation we have to make is how do we get from a recommended pounds of dry matter, so say I want 12 pounds of dry matter feed, how do I actually get that back to as fed? So we've got column A here, target dry matter pounds, we'll say 12 in both cases. Column B, the percentage dry matter. And again, how we actually get to the as fed, we take column A, the target pounds, divided by column B, the percent dry matter, multiply that number by 100, and that gives us how many as fed pounds we're supposed to be giving our cattle. All right. So with that in mind, let's talk about calves a little bit. And we've got a lot of varieties of calves and a lot of different goals for different systems. We've got steers, heifers, we've got five weights, we've got yearlings. Um, breed type isn't such a big importance here, but if you've got some dairy influence, there's going to be some, uh, some different nutrient requirements for those cattle. Where are we at with temperature? Um, and mainly, what are the goals of our systems? Are we looking for grass feds, feeders, replacement heifers? Um, when are we putting these things on feed if we do um, plan on doing that ourselves? So it all boils down to what's our target gain. And if we have a good handle on things like this going in, it makes our recommendations for how much silage calves can actually eat um, a lot easier. So if I throw the question out there, and, and I don't have access to everyone who's out there listening, so I can't get much feedback, but what do we anticipate a, a backgrounding gain would be for a grass calf? All right, this is a calf we want to kind of keep along through the winter, kick him out on grass um, once we have a good green up. Uh, what are we thinking there? And mainly, the answer is keep him alive. Okay, certainly well below a pound and a half gain. You know, somewhere around that pound maybe. So we are actually moving him in a direction, but just not very fast. Backgrounding for the feedlot, really that's all over the board too. Um, you know, you can go from that pound and a half up to three, three and a half pounds. Again, the biggest question here when it comes to target gains, more and more people are putting their calves on where they've got an anticipated weight they want them to be at. A lot of people are contracting calves this time of year for delivery in January, February. So we really need to focus on, okay, what are those pay weights on our contracts? Because depending on how the slides are on those contracts, we can really hurt ourselves by not really hitting those gains. Uh, and then as it comes to replacement heifers, I did have another slide on here and said it depends. Uh, I took it out for the sake of time, but mainly what we need to do there is we need to anticipate, okay, what is our target breeding weight? You know, we're roughly 200 to 250 days away from breeding in most cases right now. We need to figure out how many pounds we wanted to put on between now and then, and then go accordingly. Most of the time, that is well under two pounds a day. You know, about a pound and a half is about where those cattle need to be. Okay, so these are great big slides full of numbers, and I have them there mainly uh, if, if people want to print them off or come back and look at this. But this basically breaks down different weights of cattle that would come into a, a backgrounding yard right now and looks at different gains. I put a box around this first one, so let's look at the 550 pound calves. And again, from gains anywhere from one to three pounds, 
That's the total gain they'd have over a 90-day period, so from 90 to 270 pounds. And that's that end weight that we have. So if we want to have eight weights delivered three months from now, uh, we need to have them gaining at three pounds a day. And then we have the requirement for TDN and crude protein. Okay? That's where our calves would need to eat in order to gain that respective weight. Uh, that's for a 550-pound calf. We move up to 650 pounds. Each calf weight has its own uh, requirements. Interestingly, if you go through the different um, ration formulation software, there's not a difference in requirement that the software detects between steers and heifers. So that's why I just put calves up there. It wasn't a steer thing or a heifer thing. All right, so then we come in here. Once we have those answers, and, and let's use some of these definitions to get back to the original question at hand. So we're going to start out with a well-eared product. Now, this is some of that 20-ton an acre silage, uh, about 70% TDN, 8% crude protein. We're going to start to look at that product and say, all right, how much corn silage would it take to fulfill the energy and the protein requirements of these calves? So back up to this slide, right? A 550-pound calf, in order to meet the TDN requirement for a pound of gain, it needs to eat 10 pounds of dry matter. So we are right in here, 10 pounds of dry matter. As fed, he's just shy of 30 pounds of as fed dry matter. Again, that's about a 35% dry matter product. Coming up to this two pounds a day, in order to meet that requirement, he needs to eat 13 and a half pounds of corn silage. That's about just shy of 40 pounds as fed. Moving up to that three pounds a day, 17.2 pounds of dry matter or 50 pounds of as fed corn silage. Okay, that's what a calf would have to eat in order to get to those requirements. Again, we move down here. This calf that's 650 pounds, he'd have to eat 20 pounds of dry matter, 55 pounds as fed. And it ends up being a question of can a calf actually eat this much? And John did point out that there may be some limitations in terms of corn silage, and we're getting to that point in a hurry. All right, we talk about a need to eat TDN and need to eat protein, right? We need energy and calories. But there's also a limit to what our cattle can physically eat. Okay? On the right-hand side of this chart, that's what we're running into. Okay? So for a 550-pound calf, the recommended dry matter intake is about 12.9 pounds. The maximum dry matter intake, just shy of 15. And then we've got that for each of the... Uh, the other respective 650-pound calves and 750-pound calves coming into the lot. We're going to start by looking at these calves that are gaining a pound a day. And all we're going to do is go through here and say, okay, we look at the TDN requirement. So we would need to eat 10.8 pounds of corn silage to meet this requirement. And our recommended dry matter intake is 12.9. Okay, so we're not even at the recommended level. A calf could absolutely do this. Moving on, we're going to talk about something that wants to gain two pounds a day. Recommended dry matter intake is 12.9. Okay, we look back here at either the TDN requirement or protein requirement that it would take for a calf to gain two pounds a day. And we see that both of these are well over the recommended dry matter intake. So that's going to cross those out. Okay. We are feeding above the recommended dry matter intake level to gain two pounds a day. Well, if we're feeding above the recommended dry matter intake level, they certainly can eat that sometimes. All right, what about the maximal dry matter intake? So 14.9, about 15 pounds. Both of those are under that 15 pounds. So say, well, maybe we can do it, but it might be pushing it, okay? Okay. Moving on, we're going to talk about this calf that's trying to gain three pounds a day. And in order to do that, just on corn silage alone, back up one here, he's got to eat 18 and a half pounds to meet the TDN requirement, 17.7 to eat the crude protein requirement. And we look at that, there is no way that can happen. A calf physically cannot eat that much. 
So then it comes back to, well, what can we do? We can get to a pound. Two pounds is pushing it. It's possible. Not going to rule it out. Three pounds, it's just not going to happen. Limiting both by protein and energy. So then we start to look, all right, is there something that we can feed that's got protein and energy to balance these rations out? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind, just because it is simple, uh, it's available in some places. The, the product here is actually a modified distiller's grain product. Um, I did talk about a dried distiller's grain product in these comparisons. Uh, distiller's grains, uh, put it at a 91% dry matter, good protein contribution, a good energy contribution as well. For that two pounds a day target, we come in here and we got about 80% of a dry matter basis corn silage, 20% distiller's grains. Basically, we're feeding 9.5 pounds of dry matter corn silage, 2.5 dry matter distillers. You can see our as-fed inclusions. And we still get some issues here. We're still a little light on the crude protein side. And, and that's mainly what's restricting these calves from growing more. We give more protein in there and um, we will have better gains. But it's really hard to balance a corn silage diet with distiller's grains when we're looking for those low rates of gain. It becomes a lot easier as we're moving on to a three pounds a day target. In this particular case, we're at about 65% of the diet dry matter with corn silage, 35 distiller's grains. That makes us a very, very nice mix. We're right there about 14 pounds of dry matter intake. You can see what our as-fed intake is, 25 pounds of corn silage, just shy of six pounds of distiller's grains. That gives us a 15% crude protein diet. Um, very, very good, very appropriate for those 550 pound calves. So again, here we're targeting three pounds a day. That inclusion level is under 65% of the diet dry matter. Uh, and again, 25 pounds of uh, as-fed. Looking at something a little differently, um, we're going to say we've got some good alfalfa hay, we've got some corn, and we've got some liquid supplement. Uh, you can see the respective nutrient contents of each of those ingredients along the, the bottom here. And then we're going to put two different diets up here. And I'm going to leave this up to you guys to take a look at and ha maybe have a discussion about later uh, in your individual groups is, is what is the impact of, of some corn levels in our backgrounding diets, and, um, and just how do you think these two diets stack up? The diet number one, uh, we've got about three and a half pounds of dry matter, corn silage, and hay. So on a dry matter basis, that's a quarter of the diet each, uh, about 40% of the diet as corn grain, and the balance is a liquid supplement. Now, when you look at this at face value, that's about six and a half pounds of corn. That might scare some people out there. Diet number two, when we take a look at that, so we've just flip-flopped it. Said about 41% of that diet is corn silage. We've got alfalfa hay, corn grain in there. Now we're down to four pounds of corn grain. So which diet's better at the end of the day? Do we have a preference out there at all? And my concern with diet number two is, is it may make us feel good because we're not giving quite as much corn grain, but we're really approaching that maximum intake in there. Really, nutrient contents of these two diets are very similar. So, uh, again, at face value, you say, well, you're feeding too much corn to those calves in diet number one. And at the end of the day, it may be just a case of uh, corn silage has got corn in it, too. So that substitution, feeding that six pounds of corn, may not be as big of a deal as we think so at face value. Again, summarizing here, this is a person who has got a ton of corn silage that they need to feed out. Uh, so here's some things we need to consider. First of all is dry matter content. Weather going on out there, harvest conditions are really going to influence what happens. And those things are going to influence uh, how much we should include in our diets. We set a clear, a clear set of goals for calf growth and performance. Uh, that's really going to help us dial in what we want to be feeding. Silage will support low growth rates very easily. Uh, actually, it may be overkill for some of these growth rates. Once we get into anything above two pounds, we need to talk about protein energy supplementation to achieve consistent growth rates. So more questions, I can take those now, or, or again, some of this stuff will be good discussion uh, for you guys locally in your counties. So thank you very much.